Okay, so let's get down to it. GTD edge diffraction. Here is the formulation. First, you find all the points of diffraction along the rim, or in general, the edge, using the law of edge diffraction. Uh, each stationary phase point then contributes a GTD diffraction contribution in this form. Now I've written this as a vector. The vector has two components, these two components. Uh, e super D is referring to the diffracted field. The subscripts are beta naught and phi. Now these are orthogonal field components. And in fact, beta naught and phi form a coordinate system uh, with the direction of propagation. Now I'll define that coordinate system in just a moment. It's an example of a ray fixed coordinate system. So this is often a little bit confusing to people. Phi is here not the Cartesian phi. That is, it's not the phi that's associated with uh, the angle on the xy plane. It's an angle that exists with respect to the diffraction geometry. And beta naught is just the other angle that's relevant here. So again, we'll define these in a little bit more detail later. But we have these two contributions, a phi component and a beta naught component. They have unit vectors associated with them. The contribution uh, in those directions is related to the instant field, E super I, evaluated at the point of diffraction, Q. Uh, and the way they're related is by taking the dot product with respect to the ray fixed coordinate system attached to the instant ray. Note the superscript here is I, superscript here is D. In fact, you see we have two ray fixed coordinate systems, one attached to the instant ray, which is used to figure out contributions incident on the point of diffraction, and then one attached to the diffracted ray, which is uh, then used to compute the diffracted field components. Now, this is a contribution from the incident field. Then you apply a diffraction coefficient, and these are the diffraction coefficients. They are d sub s and d sub h. You may wonder what sub s and sub h stand for. Well, they stand for soft and hard. Uh, why soft and hard and not beta naught and phi? Well, the reason is historical. Those terms come from acoustics, and much of the early work in diffraction was in fact done in acoustics, so we have inherited some of that terminology. This here you may recognize as a spread factor, and it is, in fact, a geometrical optic spread factor. We'll explain that in a moment. Then you see here the expected geometrical optics phase factor. This is simply the phase accrued by traveling a distance from the point of diffraction to the field point. So the first thing to behold about this formulation is that it is very much a geometrical optics field. Geometrical optics field depends on the instant field times some coefficient, times a spread factor, times a phase factor. So GTD edge diffraction is in fact in the geo form, but the coefficients here are different and we have to be careful about the coordinate system. Now, this distance rho super C uh, is a caustic distance. It's given by this expression, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail later. But it's describing a wavefront curvature and the wavefront curvature, of course, is going to depend on an incident wavefront curvature. It's going to depend on the geometry of the rim and then the directions of incidence and departure. And then also this, this factor beta naught, which is uh, the angle to the rim. And again, D sub S and H, these are the diffraction coefficients. They depend only on the surface geometry, the diffraction point and uh, S super I and S super D. Now, note something carefully here. This is something that seems to trip a lot of people up. In reflection, the reflection coefficient is unitless. In other words, incident field times reflection coefficient gives reflected field, and the reflection coefficient has no units. In diffraction, the diffraction coefficient has units of the square root of distance. This is an error here. This should be uh, plus one half. So in other words, square root of distance. You can see that from a dimensional analysis here. See the spread factor given here is not unitless, but rather uh, goes as one over the square root of distance. 
Uh, therefore, the diffraction coefficient has units of the square root of distance. So just keep that in mind. Okay, ray fixed coordinates for edge diffraction. So here's the picture. Uh, we have the edge shown here uh, as this dashed line. The tangent to the edge is this unit vector here. We have the direction of incidence, S super i. Now this is enough to define the coordinate system for incidence. And it goes like this. You take the cross product of S super i and the edge tangent. You divide by the magnitude of that quantity to make it a unit vector. And there's a minus sign here by convention. So that gives you this vector here. And then beta naught super i hat is given as S super i hat cross phi super i hat. So from this you get this uh, trio of um, orthogonal unit vectors which defines the coordinate system. Similarly, on the diffracted ray, we have the direction of propagation here, and this is going off to the field point. That's enough to define phi hat super d as the cross product of s hat super d and the edge tangent. We make that a unit vector, and that has a plus sign associated with it. And then we get beta naught super d hat in the same manner as we got it for the incident coordinate system. We also see from this our angle beta naught, and that's equal to beta naught over here uh, by the law of edge diffraction. Now, caustic distance for the diffracted ray tube. Well, uh, this quantity rho super c that we need in the spread factor can be calculated in this manner. Uh, this comes from an analysis of the radiation integral using differential geometry. And again, you can see that reference that I suggested uh, earlier as a way to see how this comes about. Uh, in this lecture, we'll simply assume this, and I'll show you how to calculate it. Rho super C is one of the two caustics associated with the diffracted ray tube. This is geometrical optics, in form anyway. The, uh, the geometrical optics field has an associated ray tube. The ray tube has two caustics, one caustic in this case, is at the point of diffraction. So that caustic distance is always uh, S super D. And the other caustic distance is this one, rho super C. So for diffraction, we have one caustic distance that we need to uh, compute. This quantity here, rho super I sub E, is the radius of curvature of the incident wavefront in the plane of incidence. Now, as always, the plane of incidence is the plane containing the direction of incidence and the edge tangent. So what you do is you determine the direction of incidence, you determine the edge tangent, and that determines a plane, and then the radius of curvature of the incident wavefront in that plane is rho sub e super i. Now, if you have a spherical wavefront, in other words, if your feed is generating a spherical wave, which is a very common scenario, you can see right away that rho sub e super i is going to be that distance from the source to the point of diffraction. If you have a planar wavefront, then the radius of curvature is going to be infinite. Uh, you see it's going to, be going to be infinite because no matter how you draw a plane through a planar wavefront, you end up with an infinite radius of curvature. Now this quantity up here, n hat sub e, is the unit normal to the edge directed away from the center of curvature. So the idea is you have an edge, that edge has a curvature associated with it, uh, and n hat super e points away. So it always points in this direction, not in this direction. A sub E here is that radius of curvature. So locally, you can define a radius of curvature here, and that would be A sub E. And of course, all this is happening at the point of diffraction Q. Finding these quantities, N hat sub E and A sub E, can be difficult in some cases. Let me show you the generic way to get it. 
and it goes back to differential geometry. The edge, in this case the rim, can be described as a curve in space parameterized by arc length. So for example, uh, here is a curve parameterized in arc length. It is described as positions in space, x, y, and z components. And we have an expression for x as a function of l, y as a function of l, and z as a function of l. That's a standard description of a curve. The second derivative of such a description is known as the curvature in differential geometry. So we use the Greek letter kappa to refer to uh, formal curvature. And you get it simply by taking the second derivative of these functions, x as a function of l, y as a function of l, and z as a function of l. Now the reason that's useful is because the curvature, again by definition, is equal to the quantity n sub e hat that we're concerned about, divided by a sub e, the radius of curvature, and there's a minus sign out front. Just need to keep that in mind. So a simple way to get these two quantities is to get a parametric description of the curve describing the edge, take the second derivative of each of the Cartesian components, and then one over the magnitude will be the radius of curvature that you're looking for, and minus the direction will be the quantity n hat sub e that you're looking for. Now this is one approach to getting those parameters, but I should point out in many cases, they're obvious on inspection. For axisymmetric uh, circular reflectors, uh, this, these are self-evident quantities. You can tell what they are right from inspection. For other edges, you might have to resort to a procedure like this, but you see it's really not too difficult. Okay, now the diffraction coefficients. So the GTD diffraction coefficients are commonly, or I should say formally referred to as the Keller diffraction coefficients, uh, alluding to the original paper in which they appeared. This paper appeared in the 50s. Uh, so this is a relatively recent development as far as electromagnetics goes. And they look relatively simple. Uh, you might balk at that description at first glance, but compared to other descriptions of diffraction, the Keller diffraction coefficients are very simple indeed. You can see that the diffraction coefficients depend on beta naught. There's a sign beta naught down here. This parameter n refers to wedge angle, and that's wedge with the W, not just edge, but wedge. Uh, GTD can actually accommodate um, edges that look like this, that are built into uh, wedges. So an edge like this, as opposed to simply a screen-like structure like this. We'll go into this in more detail when we talk about UTD. For now, let's just say n equals 2 for screens. So when we have a screen like this, that's n equals 2. This is the case that's relevant uh, for reflector antenna problems, for example. Here's the profile of a reflector antenna, and we see that the edge here and the edge here kind of fits this description. It's the uh, edge in a flat screen. So we use n equals 2. And in the later lecture, we'll come back and I'll show you what n is for other types of geometries such as this. But that's a, a topic that we'll leave for later. We also see uh, some trigonometric functions here, some cosines. And the cosines depend on some angles, a phi sub d and phi sub i. Uh, you could probably imagine what those are already, but I'll define them formally in the next slide. Now soft and hard are different only by this sign here, as I've indicated. And then these angles here, phi super d and phi super i, are defined relative to the most directly illuminated face. I'll say again what this is in, in a moment. 